British people like each other's accents. They get a kick out of it. They sound cute, you know. So, but um, but anyway, so I mean, there is a thing about performance, you know. Like I mean, I always talk about, you know, think, you know, uh, just a, a basic thing. Like I'll, I'll tell my other classes, it's like, let's say I make a design, you know. So I say, okay, you know, here, here's my design. So I say, okay, what is this? And I said, well, it's a balloon. No, it's a cannonball. No, it's a soap bubble. No, it's a basketball. No, it's a rock. I mean, how can you tell? There's no way of knowing, you know, how, how it is. It's how it's going to move and how it's going to interact with its environment. Mm -hmm. So when you see it drop onto something, whatever, then you'll know, you know. It's like uh, Art Babbitt used to teach. He says, okay, let's say I'm going to call this an egg. So let's say I take this egg and I drop it on a silk pillow. What's going to give the egg or the pillow? The pillow. <coughs> pillow. 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 Yes. Very good. Very good. Now, let's say I take the egg and I hit it with a stainless steel black and decker <laughs> from, from Target. <laughs> What's going to give, the hammer or the egg? The egg. Yes! <laughs> now, let's say I take the stainless steel hammer, and I hit a classic Warner Brothers style iron anvil. <laughs> What's going to give, the, the hammer or the anvil? The hammer. Yes! Very good. Now, let's say I take the Warner Brothers style anvil, and I drop it from the Empire State Building onto the pavement. <laughs> What's going to give the pavement or the or the anvil? The pavement. Yes, very good. But you see, what's happening here is that you're you're understanding textures, and 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 it's how the thing interacts with this environment, knowing how that's going to interact. And that's once you understand that natural science and you recreate that for an audience, that's really cool. You know, that's fun. You know, because it is artificial. You know, I mean, the famous thing that Marshall Duchamp did was he did a realistic painting of a pipe. <laughs> you know, you know, and then and then and then you run underneath. This is not a pipe. Saying that it's not a pipe. It's it's pigment on canvas. You know, it's a lie. You know, like, I'm I'm saying it's a pipe, but it's not. You know, it's, it's a picture of the pipe. You know, that's what Picasso said: all art is lies. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like it's like we're we're saying that's what this is, but it's not. It's an illusion. But but see, the thing is, in animation, you can play like the more you understand the natural sciences and how movement works, you can play with it. So like in, in an old Betty Boop cartoon, there's a scene where uh, characters running away, a uh, crazy characters running away from the bad guys, and you see this thing. You know, it looks like a pool. And he jumps in and he goes splash, you know, like this, you know, and he swims to the other side, you know, you know, and then and then gets out and keeps running. I think it's like Bimbo the dog or something. <laughs> you know, runs away. Wow, like that. So then the bad guy character runs up to the exact same thing, the same shot, jumps in. And it goes crash like it's a pane glass window, <laughs> you know, and, and it shatters, you know, like glass. Now the thing is, the water is animated correctly, and the glass is animated to look like glass, and that creates the surreal image that the audience finds entertaining. <laughs> is that is that is that you're playing with their mind? You're saying one minute it's water, and the next minute it's glass, mm -hmm. and that's what's that's what the audience finds fun. <laughs> you know, just like personalizing or making things a little human, you know. Uh, when we were doing Pocahontas, we did the first scenes with the, um, we did the first scenes with, the, with Miko, the, uh, the uh, raccoon. And what was funny about Miko was that, originally we said we wanted Pocahontas to have a sidekick, 
to follow her around and talk to her and be her confidant or something like that. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, originally they had a turkey that John Candy was going to do the voice of, called Red Feather. It's kind of stupid, you know. And it, first of all, it's a talking, it's a talking turkey. So like she's like swinging from the trees, and running through the forest, and then here's this turkey going. So you're going to make it with the white guy? What is this? <laughs> you know, it's just like it's, it's dumb. You know, it didn't work. You know, and, and you know, and obviously the turkey couldn't keep up with her. So, so then we changed it to a raccoon because we said raccoons are fast, they can keep up with her, they got the little hands, so they don't have to poly, you know, you know, anthropomorphize, you know, they, they make it realistic. And and they're also kind of enigmatic, they don't talk or anything like that, they're very quiet, and they just kind of, you know, and you wonder what they're thinking. So you can get a lot of information out of this, like, little animal like that. And so one of the early tests that Nick Rainieri did, we, had, we, we made the thing with the with the little animals constantly hungry, so he's always like voracious. He always wants to eat all the time. So they so they give him a biscuit, and he eats the biscuit. He goes like oh, like this, and then he leaves some crumbs on the ground. And he looks down at the ground. And he goes and, and well, first of all, he eats the biscuit like a raccoon, and then he does the raccoon thing of wiping his nut muzzle. It goes like like that. And then he looks down, he sees the crumbs, and he goes. <laughs> like this, yeah. So that's a, that's something a human being would do. A raccoon wouldn't do that. But recognizing that in the in the raccoon is what makes you laugh. Mm -hmm. It's because it's a human gesture that you put into this raccoon. So it's taking those kind of things, those two thoughts, and connecting them. That's funny. You know, you, you know, that's what that's what works for an audience. And it's trying to find that kind of humor. You know, because a lot of, the other problem with humor is that a lot of humor doesn't travel. You know, I mean, it's like. They took like Jay Leno or something like that, and they ran it in Europe, and nobody laughed. It was just kind of like, I don't know, it's, you know. <laughs> I still, <laughs> but um, you know, and then and then some London, you know, some English comics come here and bomb, you know, like Lenny Henry and and uh, Dave and Average, and you know, the, the, they tried. There's some British comic communities just don't hit here, and some do, you know. So it's it's humor is very um, subjective, you know. Some countries aren't into self-deprecating humor. Yeah. You know, like, 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 you know, the, uh, I was giving a talk in, in Paris, and the translators warned me, they said, don't try to put humor in your lectures. The French don't like laughs in their lectures. They like to just, they, they, a lecture's a lecture. Okay. Yeah. So the guy in front of me was this uh, CG artist, and, and, and he got a very dry British guy, and he's saying things like, well, to this day, the most advanced computers in the world that have the intelligence of a mosquito. That's not to be said that most artists should be treated like insects. You know, you know the French way. <laughs> you know, the guys are dying up there. It's just like, I'm not laughing at anything. I'm just like, <laughs> I think the only laugh I got out of that crowd was that, was that, was that, uh, um, and, and at lunch, I held up a, a, a bottle of olive oil with uh, herbs in it. And I said, look, California wine. And they went, ah! <laughs> Big laugh. <laughs> okay, that's what you're into. It's called pandering to the crap. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, yeah, so it's finding that kind of stuff. And, and see, the thing is, uh, a lot about what we talk about in animation is 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 performance. Is it's how people move, how people act. Like people always say, like, what's the big thing, the big deal about being an animator? You know, I mean, somebody else writes the story, somebody else creates the character, somebody else um, times it out, somebody else does the voice, somebody else cuts it together. So you're just the guy who makes it moves. So what's the big deal? And I said, well, it's like an actor who plays Hamlet. You know, like you all had to read Hamlet in high school or something. So you know what he says, you know what happens to him. You basically know what he looks like, you basically know his age, you basically know the setting. You know how he relates to his girlfriend, you know how he relates to his parents, you know the things that are going on in his mind. So, what makes Laurence Olivier different from Richard Burton, different from Mel Gibson, different from Leonardo DiCaprio, different from Nicole Williamson, different from Kenneth Branagh? We watch these plays over and over and over again. And each time it's different. That's performance. I mean, it's one of the reasons why actors like Shakespeare so much. Is because you can do anything to Shakespeare and it stays Shakespeare. You know, you, you can put it on the moon, you can put it in the hood, you can put it underwater, you can put it, 
it, with chickens, you know, it's Shakespeare. It never changes, you know, you know, and that's why the actors dig it so much because they can they can do stuff with it, you know. So good character animation is kind of like Shakespeare to an actor. You know, it never leaves you. You know, I mean, whether you're doing 2D, 3D, Flash, for games, for live action. I mean, the same principles that move the orcs uh, and, and army and, and you know, in, in Lord of the Rings move Bugs Bunny, you know, and, and Roger Rabbit. It's the same principles, but you have to understand those principles and learn them before you can move those things. And the live action guys, it makes them crazy. They can't stand. That's why they're always taking actors and gluing ping pong balls to their heads, and, <laughs> you know, run around in a stupid rubber suit with the wires up your butt. <laughs> oh look, that looks just like that looks just like animation. <laughs> it's loud. It doesn't work. You know? I don't care. It's like, too bad. You know? I didn't see the current Hulk. I don't know if it was any better than. Uh, <coughs> it's better than the it was it better than the first yeah, one? Yeah. Yeah. Was the Hulk in the exposition? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, was the Hulk himself better? Because <laughs> that's always been a problem with uh, updates. It, it's like. Uh, some studios, they just, especially visual effects guys, see, they're going through their own kind of changes, too. Like, we think in animation, we're going through changes. Visual effects used to be a bunch of guys with gray ponytails <laughs> and, uh, and universal tools on their belts and their lanyards and stuff, setting off charges in a garbage can. But, you know, you know that, that was like a visual effects. You know, they build toy cities and blow them up. <laughs> Actually, it's funny, Osmosis Jones, you saw the scene where the, the zit pops up on Bill Murray. And the thing is, they built a, um, the guys who did it made a soft sculpture, because the Panavision camera can only go in on so tight a field. You have to get a special camera to, to, to shoot, like, really tiny stuff, you know. So rather than do that, it's easier to build it bigger. It's actually cheaper. So they got this um, a latex company, and they built this zit on a door, like the size of a Volcano or some other mountain, you know, latex, and they packed it full of like vanilla custard and oh. stuff. And they were fire in the hole. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> They're the same guys. Like, do you ever see the film uh, Something About Mary? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know the scene where where uh, Ben Stiller gets his naughty bits caught in a zipper. Uh, yeah. and there's a close up at one point. Oh, well, that was like big. That was like a big, like thing on a door or something. And I remember asking Peter Farrell. I said so. So what happened to that sculpture after the movie? Because Ben still has it on his living room wall. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very <laughs> weird, I think so. But I mean, the thing is, so what's happened with visual effects is, visual effects started with these guys blowing up toy models and stuff, and that was all animators, you know. And they're like going, you know, like, like character animation is, is just an effect we haven't figured out yet. You know, like, well, once we figure out the software, so we won't need you. Mm -hmm. And each time, like, no, you do, you, you do. You know, I mean, the reason why, like the first Hulk, or like Dobby, that annoying character in the second Harry Potter, you know, is <laughs> it Jar Jar Banks or something? The reason why those characters don't work, while something like the Gollum in Lord of the Rings does work, was that the Gollum was motion captured, but then a lot of really good keyframe animators went over that footage. I mean, I talked to those guys, and they said that almost all the facials were, were key fun. I mean, the idea that Andy Serkis did it was like, oh, you know, <laughs> it, it was good for it. It was good for publicity. It looked good on E Channel, you know, like, ooh, you know, you know, Hollywood Access, you know, ooh, look, Hollywood. I mean, these guys it was funny because we did this thing in the Academy. They actually brought the footage. You know, these guys from Weta actually like brought up the footage from from that uh, that, that they worked with, and I was surprised at how. Basically, the actor kind of gave him the basic location and the frame and the proportions and the basic movement. But other than that, all that facial stuff, you know, like remember in the two towers, when the uh, uh, is, is that one or in Return of the King, when when the golem was arguing with himself whether they killed the two sleeping hobbits. Two towers. Yeah. Two towers. Was it two towers? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. this one was like nobody likes you. Yeah. A bastard loves you know. You know yeah, that back and forth. That was all. That was all um, uh, keyframe animators. Wow. You know, there was, you know, I mean, all that facial work and stuff, you know. Because you understand that, like, the Ollie Johnston, one of the great nine old men, used to say, Disney animation, the point of character animation, he meant Disney animation, because to him, any, the only animation was good was Disney animation. So. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't mean anything else was <laughs> but, but he said, he said, 
He said, good character animation is not about copying life. It's caricature life. Just like you don't take a, you know, take a photograph and trace it and call it a drawing. It's not a drawing. It's a trace of a photograph. So the same thing with animation. It's like you, it, you can't just slavishly copy live action. Because like when you see, like when they used to do rotoscope and they just copied every frame, there's too many plane breaks and too many things are happening, you know. So like the, you know, characters like look, look up, you know, kind of like this. You know, <laughs> it's like, stand still. <laughs> you know? And it's like, that's why like copying every frame, you know. A, a, a character I mean, even working with live action, you have to control it. You still have to, you know, get rid of some stuff and use some stuff and, and recreate it. So like there was like in things like Captain Hook and Peter Pan, there was a little bit of live action shot underneath. But they only used like one frame every like like one frame in twenty, something like that. You know, like one you know one pose you know, as just basically you know uh, landmarks for them to work with. Hmm. So it's the same thing. So it's understanding this th these processes of character animation. They never leave you, no matter what no matter what you know medium you choose to you choose to go in. Whether you use a stylus or a pencil. Any other questions? Yeah. You've been in the industry for a long time. Do you have any of those uh, woulda, coulda, shoulda moments? <laughs> Whole lots. <laughs> a couple of few I know. Mike and I just talking about it. <laughs> it's like, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's always like that. You know, I mean, I mean, people always say, like, well, you know, I quit DreamWorks. You know, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, I quit Disney uh, on contract right now in 1995, and I went over to help start DreamWorks and stuff. And, but I only stayed a few years there. And, uh, and people say, well, you should have stayed at Disney's, you know, I mean, you know, Michael Eisner's mad at you. It's like, well, <laughs> no well. <laughs> you know, you know, and, and um, I mean, you know, I think about it and I think, well, if I had stayed, well, I probably would have finished Fantasia and maybe worked on another film. But in the 2003, they let most of the people of that unit go anyway. So, mm -hmm. would it have done me any better to do that, you know? Or should I stay at DreamWorks and not go on to Warner Brothers to do Osmosis Jones? Uh, you know, I liked it. You know, I mean, you know, I thought the film came out good. So <laughs> nobody else liked it. But I had a good time. And um, uh, it's it's yeah, it's weird, yeah, because there's always the, you know, you can't help but avoid that. You try to keep them to a minimum. You know, you try to, you just try to think, like it was a Napoleon said, the the secret of success is never hesitate. Let history figure out if you're right or wrong. <laughs> of course, he lost eventually. <laughs> but he had a hell of a run before he lost. <laughs> uh, and I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's always that, that there's different, you can take things, you know, um, you, know uh, um, you can take different directions, you know, you know. I mean, I mean, actually, like writing a book and stuff, maybe I should, I always think myself, maybe if I concentrate on screenplays, I could sell something, I don't know. You know? I mean, actually, it's funny, because when I was working on the book, I remember the, uh, one of the Disney directors telling me a long time ago, he goes, you know, you know if you, if you st stop wasting your time with history and pay attention to your art, you'd be a better animator. <laughs> and I'm like, wrote a book. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's what you do with it, you know. You know, and and it's funny, yeah, because I remember, um, it's it's it, you know, it's so weird. Like, I, I had a friend, uh, uh, he's he's a cartoonist named Batlash, and I was like, I want to say his real name's like Fido or something. But he, he changed his name. He had his name legally changed to Batlash. You know? It's like Scott Shaw legally, uh, uh, like yeah, he, he changed his name to put a to put an exclamation point at the end of his name, so it's actually like it's registered in City Hall. It's got Shaw. <laughs> <laughs> so so Bat changed the name. This and, and and Bat was doing these underground comics and stuff. And while all the rest of us went and got jobs, you know, and me and Eric Goldberg and stuff was saying like Bat. Get a job, you know. <laughs> Stop wasting your time, you know. Bat would like print these comics out, and I swear to God, he's he'd go to the San Diego Comic Con, and he just hand them to people as they walked in for free, because nobody was getting them. He's just like here, yeah, you know. Like and what happened was, Men in Black hit. Okay, studio produces movie from Weird Underground Comic. So then, so the wrote the tradition. Studio makes big movie from Weird Underground. Comic. Hellboy studio makes weird. So suddenly you go, hmm, weird underground comics, you know. So the next thing I know, I see Bat on the cover of the Hollywood Reporter with a six-figure deal with Universal to develop his character. And I'm like, this is like a Hollywood story. Like, you know, this is like in the movies, you know. This, it really happens sometimes, you know. Or the other one's like David Silverman, you know. Um, David got out of college 
and was doing all these weird independent projects and stuff. You know, like he was working on, uh, he was working for this company, uh, he and uh, Wes Archer were working for this uh, company called Laser Media, which um, they did animated laser light shows <laughs> that they would broadcast, like I think in like Stone Mountain, Georgia, they put it on the wall of the mountain or something like that. You know? wow. And it's funny because we were joking with Bob Kurtz because he said, that, you know, the KKK had rallies at Stone Mountain. And he goes, oh good, I'll lower the lasers. You know, like. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, but he's working for all these like fringe companies doing these weird things and stuff, you know, with lasers and stuff. And again, like me and Eric are like, David, get a real job. You know, get a Ruby Spears, you know, do Ruby the Amazing Cute. You know? <laughs> do pawpaws, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, so, you know, like, we were constantly hassling him. Now, I remember, like, packing my bags to go to England to work on the Frame Roger Rabbit, and David was talking on the phone, he goes, yeah, I just got this job uh, on the Tracy Ullman show, and Matt Groening, the guy who does, like, Life in Hell in the LA Weekly, he's going to do a sitcom, and it's going to be like a family thing, like the Flintstones used to be. And I go, what's it called? And he goes, The Simpsons. And I go, what's a stupid <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> it's like it's a name, you know, like the Wellingtons, you know, the the Worcesters. You know. What's funny about that? It's like I didn't know it's a big deal. You know, it became a big deal. You know, and David, like, bam, you know, right in the middle of it. So he was like the senior director, and he directed the Simpsons movie, and uh, he's probably worth a lot more than me now. <laughs> you know? so, and he just, you know, he found that niche, and pow, you know, it went. So. If you listen to me, <laughs> like, you know, and so I mean, who knows? You know, I mean, that's the, that's the weird thing. It's not like what's going to what's going to succeed and what's not. Or something, mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 you know, it's literally when they have that old phrase, "That's Hollywood." And you go, "Oh, is that what that means?" <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, it's it, it's it's hard to say. You know, it, you know, and and I, I think, like you say, you know, you 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 know. It, you try to keep your, like what I would say is, is um, try to keep your, your, um, uh, you know, follow your instincts, and you know, to use a, to use a tired Southern California, you know, you know, uh, metaphor, it's kind of like surfing. You know, you kind of like you pedal out, you know, and you sit there on the board and you wait for a wave, you know, and hopefully when the wave, the wave comes, you think you, should, you know, you get on it because you might let it go by and then like, oh, you know, like I mean, actually, I thought about it. One of the things that convinced me to go to DreamWorks originally was I thought, if I don't, it's going to bug me. You know, I'm going to think about it later and go, maybe I should have went with that. I don't know. You know maybe I should have you know, so. so it is like, you know, kind of like that. I mean, actually, too, in, in, in the first trick, uh, which uh, uh, one of my contributions was uh, I named the villain, because the villain's name was Evil Lord Farquhar. <laughs> and uh, in the original script, it was Evil Lord Hamilton. Huh. And I go, that's not funny. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a funny name. Like, what's funny about Hamilton? You know? and, and I had a graduate student at SC named Mark Farquhar. And I said, Farquhar's funny. <laughs> Hamilton's not funny. And actually, his schoolmates used to make up definitions of what a Farquhar is. So it's like when you go in a men's room, uh, you, 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 know, you go in a restroom, and you sit on a toilet that's already warm from someone else's butt. That's a Farquhar. <laughs> so I said, that's funny. <laughs> I like that. And the thing is, Mark totally dug it. You know, like Mark was like, he'd answer his phone in a dream. He became a good character animator. I think he teaches at CSUN now. But, uh, but he would answer his phone like evil or far more. <laughs> so, and it's funny. And some people totally don't get it. Like, like some people go totally the other way and they're angry. You know, like the, the Farrelly brothers told me that um, when they did Me, Myself, and Irene, that a neighbor in Rhode Island named Billy Blavatsky. And it was really the guy's name. Wow. And they said, Billy, what a cool name. <laughs> Can we use that? That's a wonderful name. You know, I'd love to do something with that. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, they, so we take it, they make the movie. The movie comes out, Billy sues them. <laughs> I'm like, got, got, got $100,000 settlement. <laughs> Just like, oh. <laughs> you know, so that's why they actually changed the name Farquaad to Farquaad. They mm. put like a D at the end and stuff. Just in case. Just in case. <laughs> Somebody get you something. Anyway, I think we got time for like one more or something. Mm -hmm. What would you say was your favorite project that you worked on? Oh, see, um, that's good. Yeah, yeah. I just feel like every f so in thirty mean, years, you feel like less of a human. Yes. 
I know it's funny. I never understood. You know, I, I never knew He-Man would be that big a deal. You know, know? It's just, I never knew. You know, I mean, I remember sitting next to Don Manuel, and we were working on stuff, and I said, "Come on, the name of this thing isn't really He-Man. <laughs> this, is, this is like a, a temporary name. You know, it's gonna be like Ragnar or Torak or something." You know? And he goes, "No, oh, it's really He-Man." <laughs> Well, you know the story too about wasn't it like a He-Man originally was supposed to be um, merchandise to go with the Conan the Barbarian movie that Schwarzenegger was in, you know, wow. Lamentations of the Women, you know, and <laughs> and, um, wow. and apparently uh, like Mattel like made like you know fat warehouses full of these like little toys and stuff, and then when they saw the final movie, it was so much more R-rated, so much more sexual and violent and stuff that they anticipated that they pulled out of the deal. And so they said, we're not going to advertise this thing because you can't show it to kids because it's too adult. So they got warehouses full of these toys, so they just changed the name. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing shot off. <laughs> wow. you know, so we, you know, then we came up with, you know, She-Man. <laughs> Native American man. <laughs> it's just like, it's like, you know, actually, it was a funny thing, but uh, I was signing DVDs at the Comic-Con, and, 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 and I had this one, um, it was like different fans and stuff. And there's one, uh, you know, and you know, and then you do a sketch for them or something, or pictures. And this, and this one lady came up to me. First of all, she was an adult dressed as Shira, which is kind of unusual. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, just like completely. And, and and I said, to her, she says, "Can you do me a drawing?" And I said, "Yeah, sure, I'll do a drawing." She goes, "I want you to draw Shira being dragged off by Skeletor, and she doesn't mind." <laughs> hey, somebody has some issues. <laughs> somebody has a very healthy fantasy life. Right? <laughs> you know, what the heck? So. What are we? I don't want to get speakers on that. Um, Tom Zito. Tom Zito. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's 2128. 2128, thank you. Okay. So. But, um, yeah, so, yeah, I feel like, I'm like every every five years I get a project that's fun to work on, you know? Like, not all, like not all of them are good. I mean, sometimes you're going to be on something you're just going to hold your nose and just kind of, all right, you know, yeah. you know, let's just get it over with, you know? And, um, you know, you know, like, you know, to, you know, Son of the Mask without Jim Carrey. <laughs> like, in Cameron yeah. Diaz, which is pretty weird. But actually, when you're looking at the footage, you're sitting there going, these are like the stand-ins for the real actors. <laughs> you know, this, is, this is really the footage. Because <laughs> you know, the thing is that live-action movies, they get these, what they do is, uh, it takes them like about two, you know, an hour or something to do the setup. So, so the real actors sit in their trailers and do drugs or hang out or read Dianetics or something. I don't know. And, 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 and <laughs> while they're like doing the lights and stuff. So they get people that look exactly like them to stand there and just be lighting models. So these two people just stand there and they do the lights and stuff and other thing and they stand there for hours, you know. Well, they, and that's their job. That's what they get paid for. You know? So, so, so I'm sitting there looking at this going, these are like the lighting models. They don't like the real people, you know. But um, anyway, to make a long story longer, um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I mean, Roger Rabbit was a lot of fun. That was a good crew. That was like a, a fun project to work on. And um, and uh, uh, the uh, yeah, He Man was fun. Uh, yeah, I mean, some pictures were tough. I mean, Lion King, nobody thought it was going to be a hit. I mean, everybody thought, like, with Lion King, they thought, like, oh, you know, the, the, it's very dark, and the father dies, you know, it's, it's, you know, people want to be on Pocahontas, they thought that was going to be the hot project. Wow. It's like Lion King, well, it goes out, whatever it does, it does. And, and, oh, and the thing is, they hadn't hired Hans Zimmer yet. So the thing is that when you got songs, you got Elton John with his little keyboard Casio, you know. <laughs> 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 You know, and this guy like, this song sucks. <laughs> and then we didn't know that Hans Zimmer was going to bring in Lady Smith, Black Mombasa, and the drums, and all the orchestration, and I mean, the choruses, and you're like, wow, that's good. <laughs> it's really good. I mean, that's the other thing, too, is that sometimes when you do storyboards, you're going to work on a scene that you know is lousy, but you do it anyway. And the thing is, there was a song in Lion King that James Earl Jones sang. Now, James Earl Jones can't sing. <laughs> he speaks. He's got a great speaking voice. It's right. wonderful. But he can't carry a tune. You know. So there's a thing called Mighty King of the Wild. It's right after uh, Simba wakes up, Mufasa goes, dad, 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 dad. And they go out on the parapet, and he goes, Simba, this is all our land, but don't go there because it's scary. Stay here. Oh, okay. 
you know, this, you know, that, that, that scene, right? There was a song there called oh, Mighty King of the Wild. <laughs> right. and, and we got this cassette, and it's James Earl Jones going, We King is a huge obligation. It's not just a reason for the photo. You know? <laughs> 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 Besides that he can't sing, it's, it's a bad song. You know? <laughs> you know? And it's funny because I was working with this guy named Bernie Mattinson, who's like this 50 year old veteran and stuff. And, and he gave me a lesson in professionalism because I'm like, God, this song is terrible. I don't like to do this. And he goes, Yeah, all right. Yeah, it is. It stinks. I don't like it at all. He goes, You take the first chorus, I'll do the bridge. You take the second chorus. You know? And then we did it. You know, we drew like 300 panels, put the whole thing up on the wall, yeah. bash it to the music. Bring in the brain trust, you know. Bring in the producers and directors. Go through the whole film, and the, and they looked at it and they go, "That song stinks." <laughs> and they go, yeah, yeah. But if you told them, if you went up to them and you get "That song stinks," they'll go, "Well, you've got a bad attitude." <laughs> you know, we spent a lot of money on that song. You know? and, and but you show them, and then they go, "Oh, yeah, that song doesn't work." <laughs> you know, so. You know, it's 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 weird. It's a, but but as part of the process of doing storyboard is that they 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 want to work out the problems in that stage before they're on a you know, like in live action. You're out in the desert with 80 people and, and, and you know, I mean it's weird the first time you see a live action film doing that because like with, with Osmosis Jones, I noticed that the Farrellys hadn't really done anything for some of the live action, and in order to figure out the pacing and the animation, I had to I had to put in. Uh, uh, things to approximate the live action to see how they interrelate to one another. So I did this opening shot of a crane shot of uh, starting on the top of the zoo and then you come to the zoo and then over to the monkey cage where Bill Murray and the little girl are watching the monkeys. And I put this all in to the stage in, in, in Massachusetts. And, uh, and I go out to the stage and I sit there and I'm sitting in the zoo and there's the dolly and it's doing my shot. You know, I thought, I set up all this stuff, you know, you know, and it's so weird because it's probably so easy for the writer to go establish Sue, Bill Murray in front of me, you know, and then I spent five minutes drawing this little camera angle, and then it's like eighty people with trucks and stuff and doing this. You know, then here's a weird thing: they actually had to build the zoo that you can't they can't film in the zoo because apparently they said there's a law that you can't mix trained animals and wild animals. Hmm. In the same place, and the trained animals will tell them something. Balance the ball. I don't know. It's I, there's some kind of weird law. So they actually had to make a zoo out of nothing. In it. It was kind of fascinating to, to watch. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to see Hollywood set dresser. You know, like they did this thing. We had to do an emergency room. And they used the basement of a public school because it has that green institutional tile, you know, the, the, you know, the, you know, yeah, you know that stuff from Fort Monica, and yeah. You know. And um, and anyway, so they built this emergency room, and and what I was amazed at the set dressing was so good that when you walk past the, the nurses' station, there was a Polaroid picture stuck in the corner of the window of three nurses having margaritas after work. <laughs> and I just thought, nobody's going to see this. I mean, it's not even in the shot, but they wanted all that stuff for texture, so wow. they'll look good. You know, you walk in and you just go, wow, this is an emergency room. You know, and it's just like, wow, these guys are good. <laughs> you know, that's amazing to watch, you know. So that's another kind of, you know, direction. You know, so. Anyway, we're at 2 o'clock. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.